Um, welcome, everyone. Um, uh, thank you for the introduction, Francesco. This is uh, really a dream conversation for me. Um, I've always been captivated by uh, how great technology comes to be, and it's, it's always an interesting story and process and a complex one. And it's one that we can all learn from, and, and that's the motivation for, for, for this structure here, uh, to, to discuss uh, context, and process and story around the emergence of this, this beam technology. Um, so uh, as Francesco stated, we have uh, Baron Decker, uh, Mike Williams and Robert Verding. Um, I'd be of course remiss to, to, to not mention the, the, the absence of our, our dear friend, Joe Armstrong, who is always a part of these conversations and who is just terribly missed right now. Um, so I'd like to dedicate this conversation to his memory and we're gonna take some time at the end to share some stories about how Joe Armstrong has, has affected us. Uh, and uh, in, in just quick little anecdotes um, to, to give some, some flavor to, to his influence. Um, so this is structured around uh, three parts. We have the, the context in which Erlang uh, was, was conceived. So this isn't the final product, but this was the, the, the context that led up to the decision uh, to create a new language and how that affected the language itself. Um, second part is uh, how the final product, how Erlang was implemented and how it was received, which I think is notable because it's a very, very unique uh, language and unique environment. And then finally, just sort of an ad hoc conversation around retrospective. So uh, what was learned, what might have been um, different. And then, as I mentioned, we're going to share some, some Joe stories. Um, so with that, um, we have uh, the, the Erlang context, and I'm not sure... Um, who starts? I think Bjarna, you're, this is uh, this is your uh, um, this is your this is your time. I'll hand it over to you. So Bjarna, you are muted at the moment. There we go. Oh, do you want me to say something? Well, if you want, or, or Mike, or anyone, I, I, this is <laughs> who's 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 gonna. I, I, I think this I, is probably. I, I the can. Best I can. On here. I can tell you about the, the, this photograph anyway. It was taken in 1991. Uh, and that was the time of the great big international switching symposium, a huge conference in Stockholm for telecoms people. And we were a small part of that. Um, we, uh, that's where we present, where Joe presented Erlang the language that was, and and we also hosted uh, technical visits. People coming to through our lab to 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 watch a demonstration about this new language. The, this demonstration, Joe thought, was so so clever that it should be a sort of uh, saved for for the future. So we had it put on videotape, and that's become the famous uh, like the movie. And uh, yeah, after, after all this effort, uh, I think we, we, we were allowed to take a day off. We went out to a park called Jurgården in for a nice walk in the nice weather. And you see me in a cap in the, in the phone booth. And you see at, at the front is, is Joe. And you perhaps recognize one or two other people. So. Uh, but then the lab had, had existed about 10 years almost, Formal, formally established in 84, but it started actually earlier. Is that, is that the meeting we had the, we had the train set? No. no, 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 that was later because that was a, that was a programming conference. I oh, okay, okay. Huge, I mean, you, you have no idea. How they feel the globe, etc. now. Okay, okay. Oh, by the way, yes, Joe, uh, Robert, you're you're in this photo. You see, see this chap further to the left. That's yeah. Robert. <laughs> That's me. Yes. And then yes. Mike is. Oh, it's just behind. He's hiding yes. behind Joe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, so Bjorn, um, could you share with us some of the? Um, you founded this. The, you co-founded the CS Laboratory, Computer Science Laboratory. Um, could you share with us some of the? Um, well, we call this philosophy of work, but the process that was sort of part of the culture at the time within Ericsson. Oh, yes. 
uh, this is uh, the process of applied research uh, because at that time there were laboratories involved working on fiber optics, soldering, all sorts of regular technologies. And here we came sort of with programming. That was at the time when we tried to explain to other people that programming is actually a sort of engineering profession, well, something you have to learn, etc. And we also came with the idea that that you can could run experiments in programming just like you run experiments in, in hardware. And this was a time we, we had learned about functional programming, expert systems, etc. So, so then how to introduce new technology into Ericsson? Well, the idea was really experiments. So, so I, either there's a new technology and we see, do we have an application or else there's a sort of opening or a problem and people want to see, can we have new technology to do something with this? Actually, th this is a way of being very careful instead of just throwing new technology straight into the production. Yes, run a small, small scale experiments and see what happens. So, okay, so we go from the le left experiments and then evaluation and either give up, say, say that, oh, it didn't work or else you go and do something uh, serious with it. Or, or you can just loop around. But, so this was, we had once people coming to the lab to sort of see how the lab was work functioning. We got very high marks. <laughs> that was because they had asked me, I, I, was a, I was a boss, what are we, you doing? And then I'd asked various people in the lab, what are you doing? And they were very surprised that they got the same answer. <laughs> Everybody had this idea, this is actually what we're doing. So, uh, programming telecom, that was actually the one thing. We were doing expert systems and workstations. You were one of the first to use Unix uh, at Ericsson, etc. By the way, Bjarne, one thing you might mention is that one of the people that came to visit us was actually Dennis Ritchie. Yes, you, you. <laughs> and he got on very well with Joe. Yes, he did, yes. <laughs> Like you had in, in your experience, you, you coming from other parts of Ericsson into the CS lab, how did you feel the culture? It was a different, or was it a, a sort of a continuation of Ericsson's philosophy, but applied to the newer field of computer science and programming? Oh, it was very different. It's very different. It was an opportunity to do things that you really wanted to do, rather than sort of working to deliver a product which had to be ready in tight, tight schedules. Oh, yeah, it strikes me. It strikes me that this idea. I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but the the idea dropped side is you know a manager sees this typically and just sees dollar you know Corona mm -hmm. signs uh, uh, you know plummeting and P and L problems and all sorts of things. Um, that this idea of actual research and development where you don't know the outcome of the work seems to be a uh, 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 rare and. Was it something to fight for? Was it just something to carve out? Or was there a general acceptance that to do something really innovative, you have to be allowed to truly fail without any certainty ahead of you? Oh, but, but look, that was a time when Ericsson had quite a lot of money <laughs> because of the success of the AXC system. So I think at the time, sometimes there was about 10 or 15 labs. So we, we were not, not the only ones. And, and also, it wasn't that Mike came to the lab. It was Mike and me and two other people who, who, who wrote the proposals. Oh, I see. But, but then when things got tougher, bo both CS Lab and various other labs were also closed down, ju just, uh, just as you say. We were mm. just fortunate that we had created something that was then uh, standing on its own feet. I mean, there are quite a lot of other people might, might have had good ideas, but I mean, they were just cut. Well, it, it's, it strikes me, and in our, our correspondence uh, before our discussion, Bjarna, you mentioned the some series of events that were rather fortuitous and uh, things that if they, you know, they didn't happen, things may have, for Erlang and the ecosystem might have turned out very differently. And it strikes me that that window of support 
for a true R&D function might have been one of those for, for fortunate, fortunate um, starting, certainly a starting point. Oh, yes. I mean, we had some luck. I mean, we, had, we, we were part of Ericsson Telecom, which was a conventional uh, telecom systems. And then Ericsson Radio was a growing one, mobile telephony. And they didn't, those two parts of Ericsson didn't like each other. So they, they were the ones who decided not to use Erlang. And it was, this wasn't our fault, we were just caught up in. But yes, and, and the idea of open source came exactly at the right moment. I mean, this famous book about the cathedral and the bazaar, that happened to appear exactly when we needed it. So I want to shift a little, I'm going to skip out that, this one here, I think. Um, uh, well, no, we, don't. No, we, want to, we want to keep that. So I, I have an order wrong here, but let me, I'll go back to that in a moment. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the lead up to Erlang itself and, and the work that you did, you know, without, certainly Erlang was not a starting point. It, it was a, a point along, along the way. What preceded that? And what were some of the problems that your, your lab was tasked with? And the, but these slides, by the way, are just fodder. They're not, please don't feel a need to talk about all these points. They're just here for, for recollection. But Mike, you wrote a paper that with the conclusions. I, I think the problem that we had was that at this time we had a, the AXE system, which was very successful. But the problem with the AXE system, that developing the software for the AXE system was exceedingly expensive. So uh, the, the main question was, well, can you do anything about it? Can you find some way of developing software for this type of system, which is cheaper? The normal metric for, for how much code was actually written was that two lines of Plex programs were written per hour, which when you think about that is uh, it's not very much. The, the background of all this is that telecommunications uh, that time and uh, had what was a domain which had a problem which had problems which would be very typical and very useful today but um, the main thing about telecommunications which made them different from everything else was at that time an enormous massive concurrency and if you think about a normal operating system like Unix, you have processes and all the rest of it, there's no way you could have one Unix process per telephone call. It just, it just wouldn't work. Or one process, Unix process per subscriber. And therefore you had to have something where you had lightweight processes. And Bjarne uh, previously had worked with two previous languages which were used in production. One of them was called uh, PL163, which was a sort of a structured assembly language. And the other one came later, which was Eric Pascal, which was a uh, extension of Pascal with message passing. And it was these things which really sort of said, this is the sort of basis of what we want to do. And one of the things we thought we might do at the beginning was simply sort of use Eric Pascal as a sort of substitute for Plex. But um, that really wasn't good enough. We had the systems were done with Eric Pascal already. So we said, well, what are the other things? So, and, can you not use anything which already existed? And so, so um, for a number of years, uh, I worked with Ada and traveled down to Brussels, where uh, the, uh, the European Union had a, or the European, um, the EEC, the Economic Community, as it was at the time, had a thing called a Ada Europe, which was saying, how could we use Ada for telecommunications? I think the result of that says long study was answer. The answer was you can't. Uh, so it wasn't. It was a big study and cost a lot of money. We didn't get anywhere. Uh, so we looked at other sort of things. I'm not going to go through this list, but uh, we rapidly came to the conclusion that if you want something with a massive concurrency, you have to do it yourself. There's no other way that can be done. And that, that means that uh, you can't use the concurrency in an operating system. Uh, you have to do, do concurrency yourself. The other problem that uh, AXE had solved was a, it was a successor to another exchange was that it had a very, very fine grained memory, man, man, memory management unit called a reference memory. 
And this basically was because the previous system had been beset by errors for wild pointers and wild size changes. And the um, uh, AXE had solved this with, with its uh, architecture. The, uh, I mentioned the person, I think, uh, who certainly deserves an awful lot of credit for the ideas of concurrency is a guy called Jörn Hemdahl, who was the father of uh, of uh, the AXE system. He worked out the hardware, he worked out the software, he was a real character. And uh, a lot of his ideas, were, we possibly didn't use his ideas as such, but we used the idea that these problems, he defined very clearly, these are the problems which need to be solved. So there's a solved in Plex, and we said, well, how can they be solved in some, with something else? Which is why we would sort of look, looked at uh, the various things and came to the conclusion we just have to do something else and we have to make our own implementation. Oh. Which, led, which led to uh, the, the ideas behind airline. And another thing which was a realization, which I don't think uh, came to us very early, which was to some extent uh, controversial, was that um, all programming languages. You know, all programs, all, all programs have got bugs in them. And uh, a serious bug which causes an error has to be dealt with. And therefore, the idea of having uh, methods from recovering from both hardware failure and software errors was something which we regarded as absolutely essential, that, that, we, uh, that was part of the language, which is why the um, ideas of uh, he, which came into airline of uh, links and trap exits and exit signals and default action of exit is allowing things to crash is what, what, why they came in. So that, that, that's a sort of roughly sort of roughly the background. This is what this was the problem we needed to solve and create a language to do it. Um, so Rob, Rob maybe, I have a question. Weren't, weren't, weren't we at a conference once in England? Uh, where we went down and looked what others, other people were doing, other, other companies were doing, and we sort of asked the question, what happens if something goes wrong, right? And I think That's right, yes. The only yeah. people that had thought of, that, thought of that problem and, well, thinking of a solution around that problem. So Robert, I, I that, that, that was right. With you. That, um, um, I was thinking of another conference in, uh, <laughs> in London where we actually looked at uh, Strand, uh, not Strand, it's Strand, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, uh, parallel uh, parlog. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. That was fun. Sorry, that I'm was fun. That, that was for fun. That, yeah, yeah. That's I a, like that logic language. We ate pizza. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so something that strikes me here, and and Robert, I recall a conversation that we had many years ago um, about the relationship between the existing hardware platform, which of course had elements of software, but it's largely a, a hardware engineering platform and how those influenced the set of requirements for, for ultimately Erlang. And one, one topic that came up was this idea of linking and the ability to reset an entire circuit of quote unquote processes, however those were represented in the hardware. Um, you'd go high on a, on a voltage and it would reset. And this, was the, uh, this is what triggered the idea or this is what inspired the idea for, for linking processes so that you'd have a cascade. Am I misremembering, or is that is, is that's, that's quite correct? This was okay. the something which came from the original relay-based uh, telecommunication systems, what we call the C wire. The C okay. wire was what held everything together, and if you drop the voltage on the C wire, the whole thing re reset itself. And this was done individually for parts of the system, not the complete system. So that it was a way of sort of saying, "This thing's gone wrong. Drop it." And uh, telephony, to, to some extent, is rather nice because uh, the default of uh, action is that no one is talking to anybody, and it's very easy to sort of go go back to that. So that it's it's, it's not like as a financial transaction, which if it goes wrong, you have to make sure the money's landed in the right place. In, in telephony, you just have to make sure that no one's talking to each other. Uh, you, you solve that problem. But wasn't the, didn't the see why or Resetting that would take down a whole se sequence of. Um, it would take a whole, the C wire linked together a whole sequence uh, in, in a call. And if you drop the voltage on the C wire, everything in that sequence uh, broke down, which was one yeah. of the idea basically of a, of a transaction. 
Uh, yeah. The other idea came from a transaction which um, came from a, 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 a concept in the AXE, which has got the name Forlop, which is a Swedish for transaction. And the, 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 these two ideas, so we have to have transactions and we have to have a way of resetting transactions in the system. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's why Erlang links look like they do. You link together a bunch of processes and yeah. one dies, they all die, which was basically exactly the same thing as the CYR was doing, which is some, yeah. Um, yeah, that was that was fun. Um, well, that, that, uh, I actually later, Robert, that uh, I wrote, uh, wrote the code for the, the, the jam emulator. And <laughs> um, one thing, a nice story there is that we demonstrated the um, prologue system we'd done previously and uh, something went wrong and you changed code. And uh, the person as I had as our manager at the time said, gosh, you've changed code on the fly. Can you do that? And, and, and you and, uh, and Joe nodded and said, yes, we can do that. And I scratched my head and said, how the blooming hell can I do that in the, uh, in the jam? So I spent about a week scratching my head to sort of implement that because we promised to do it and I didn't know how to do it. But you did it. You did it. Yeah. We did it, which is, I think, more or less the same way as it works today. But I've lost a bit of touch of that. Probably, I, I think. I think we have to. I have to say, we weren't above taking ideas from anywhere. No, no, of course not. No, if you, if, if something had a good idea, take it. Right, there's nothing against doing that. So, before we get the into the bits and before pieces, we get into the implement, you know, sort of where you landed with at least early on with with Erlang, um, how how much so we clearly you were constrained by the current technology at Ericsson and, and the need to support that in looking at that how much further beyond beyond the status quo were you thinking in the development of the software platform since obviously with software you're looking to the future to do new things that couldn't be done before and go certainly go faster but was there, were, were you really thinking far beyond the existing Ericsson topology or were you just pretty much trying to support the existing topology with a more efficient platform? No, we were definitely thinking about the new technology because there was no way that the, uh, the uh, airline as it was implemented even in its uh, first virtual machine could have been run on the existing technology. So we were looking about what could be done in the next generation of systems that uh, one of the requirements that we had uh, was that, it should, uh, the, the, that we should be able to run on the standard operating system on standard hardware. Hmm. And uh, that definitely, the, the, whatever you can say about the Ericsson systems at the time, they weren't standard hardware and they weren't standard operating systems. So it was the next generation. developed from the very bottom to the very top, right? I think that that's done right, everything. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, so we were running standard stuff. I mean, we're using a VAX or a, a actually P, uh, sometimes a um, PC and we're running Linux or Unix on top of it, straight out of the book, nothing, nothing, nothing strange about that in that sense. So, yeah. So, so we have this rather, I mean, I, it's, it's hard for me to imagine today a set of requirements that are quite this steep for a, a totally new ground up or, you know, ground zero top to bottom stack to build. So you had this, could you talk a little bit, I think we're now perhaps into the implementation um, and reception, but before we sort of get about the, the, the hard, the, the, the actual implementation, could you talk a little bit about where, how, how, how Erlang itself, just the, 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 the language itself came to be conceived? Um. Let's see if so. If you step back a few slides, one with the circular, one more, that one there. That that that's that's very much how we worked. So we had we had our we had ideas um, about well we had the problem we had the set of requirements from a problem we had ideas about how to solve them, and we, we tried to implement a system that did that. And then we're also very lucky to collaborate with a group outside who were looking at um, uh, and they were developing a new architecture and they wanted something to test the architecture with. So we could, we could give them a system with our ideas and they could test it and come back and see, did this actually work for them? Right? Did, did it solve their problem or, or not? 
and what, what worked and what didn't work. And then we could come back and rethink. We sort of went round this ring quite a few times with, with ideas, with their comments, their ideas, well, what was useful, what wasn't useful, what was good, what was bad, and everything like this. And that, so the language evolved very much, or the properties of the language evolved very much from this, from this point of view. And we're very lucky to have this group who were um, very much on, on, the, on the application side. They weren't taking part in the, well, developing the outline, but they were, they were very much in, in the, on the user side and they had a very good idea of what was necessary to build their systems. Right? So we when get you say hard. application sites, were these, were these deployments or were they sort of uh, concept checks and, and maybe uh, early alpha testing of concepts? Um, if I remember correctly, Mike, Michael Bion will have to correct me here. They, they, were doing an they were trying to develop a new architecture. They were trying to develop a new architecture for private branch exchanges for the sort of exchange you had in offices at the, in those days. So that's an example of a driver that was a fundamentally new driver that, that led your group along a, a new, a totally new path. Other yeah. than the, just bringing software to bear on these, these problems, you had new application frontiers to explore. Yeah, so, so it was also looking at, looking at uh, what went into the language um, our idea is how you could use these features to build the system, to get the properties you want of the system. And they could get feedbacks on that. We got feedback from that as well too, right? So, so not just the language, but how, how, you'd, how would you make an architecture with this? Did it work? Did it do what they wanted it to do or what they needed it to do or not, right? But, but you, you might say that this was the only time that there existed a formal definition of that island. <laughs> yeah. the, the language that Joe happened to work <laughs> with just now. <laughs> yeah, oh, sorry. yeah, but, but that was that was so it was a, it was a very iterative and pragmatic process. How, it, how it, long? I mean, I, we have a time. We don't have a timeline on here, which would be helpful. But um, Robert or anyone, your recollection: How long did this cycle run before you felt like, okay, we've got this thing? It's called Erlang, and it, it, it looks like this. About three years, I would think. Yeah, it, it was a long. It was a long process to do this. Um, again, as, as said, it, went, it went round the ring quite a few times, right? Before the what? language, before we got the features right, um, the right set of primitive low low level features with which you could build things on top of that, and how you build things on top of that, and how you make a system to get these properties and things like this. What that took a lot of work to work. A lot of time to work that out, right? And and to have them test it and come back and say yes, no, good, bad, etc., like this, right? Or fantastic, but we can't use it. That happened. We, a we had of a times, philosophy so. as well, which is which is rather possibly a little bit egocentric. We had the philosophy at the time that uh, if you get an idea, if you can't implement it yourself, forget it. I mean, the, the idea was very much you had to sort of be capable of programming it, dealing with it yourself. It wasn't a sort of a good group of people writing a specification and another people, another group of people trying to sort of implement it. It was do it yourself or forget it. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah so well, was, well, our ideas, we implemented them. That's why they could test them. That that was also very, I think, a very a critical phase of the whole thing. That would, that every every new idea we can we implemented and they tested it um, in the hard way, right? By actually using it and running it and things like this for it. And um, that's why that's why if you if you look at Alang in many ways, it's a mixture of things because it worked. My classic uh, case is we weren't <laughs> out to make a functional language. It became functional along the way because that worked. And we weren't out to implement the actor model. <laughs> I'd never heard of the actor model, actually, until afterwards someone read a paper saying we'd implemented the actor model. But we arrived at the same thing because that, that was something that worked for the type of thing we were trying to do. And yeah. Yeah, I'll talk uh, to Carl Hewitt about that. And he, he thought that was a very good proof of the benefit of the actor model because he got it from both theoretical and the practical side for it. Sorry, yeah, go. No, no, this is we're, we're, we, we have a fundamental race condition um, social environment here. It's lovely. So <laughs> we have about, I think, about a two second uh, interval where we, where we uh, who knows what's going to happen. Uh, um, Mike, to your point, and uh, Robert, to your point, um, I, I reread Joe's um, interview at, um, uh, with uh, in the book uh, um, Coders at Work. And this is, was one of his points is 
um, J Joe's sort of instinct was to do it himself. And if, if and, and he would run into uh, uh, this dynamic where he would look at something, feel it was too complicated or feel it was unnecessarily complicated and then just do it again, do it himself. And this developed in him as this sort of mindset of, of fearlessly penetrating the black box and, and not, not settling for any kind of status quo. And it sounds like that was very much a philosophy of the team at large. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, I would say we, we didn't really know where we were going. So we knew, we knew in a general direction which way we were planning to go, right? Sort of set of features, but what does this mean? What, what, did the, what did these requirements actually mean when you look at them and how, how to implement them, et cetera? So we, we, sort of we were sort of tracing out, working out our path as we were going, right? Bjarne, when you and saw then, all of this unfolding under your, under your watch, how did, you, how did you feel about the early stages when these folks were, were exploring and kicking around ideas and maybe not, you know, how did you feel that was going early on? Oh, I, I, <laughs> I, I knew it was moving forward. The, the key thing is that these, the, the, the early users, mm. they, they were, were not set on experimenting really. I mean, they were uh, set on creating an architecture and evaluating it. And they, they wanted a tool to do their pro prototyping. Um, so the, this was the anchor, the, the anchor and Robert to your point, you, you, it drove everything. It drove your your work. Your work. Oh, yeah, that, that was also a way to check that that, that this work was moving for, forward. So this strikes yeah. me as as fundamentally agile. Well, what has become known as agile programming, uh, long before it was ever codified. That you were in these tight, very tight feedback loops where you would have an idea, you'd write some code yourself. That might not be perfect, but it could be used and experimented with a, a user community, and you work very closely with that community. Yeah, 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 definitely, because because they are the ones who really knew what they wanted or what was necessary for doing their system, what type of features they had to have, and was our solution that provided these features was it a good solution? I, I mean, we might have thought it was fantastic, but from their point of view, it might have been terrible, and then they'd come back with that. And, and and again, we came up a number of times with with um, solutions we thought were fantastic to the problem, but we just mis misunderstood the problem. And they would say, yeah, no, it's, it's fantastic, but we can't use it, type of thing. Right? So that, that's, um, that, that's a, there's a lot of that went in for it. And there were a so, lot of discussions. I still remember sort of uh, Joe, Mike and me, we had rooms beside each other and we'd be arguing and shouting at each other with new ideas and criticizing other ideas and taking long taking long walks lunchtime walks with joe we would argue things backwards and forwards right should it be like this or should it be like that or things like this for it as well uh there was a lot of arguments but there were positive arguments in the sense that it's we, we, we were getting somewhere along the way what was a uh, um robert in that vein what was one of in your recollection one of the the points of dispute do you, do you recall any in particular a very a, a trivial one that went backwards and forwards a long time. If you send a message to a process that's died, what should happen? Okay. So now, should it just disappear? Or should you get back an exit, a, a, a signal from it saying the process didn't exist or something like this, went backwards and forwards a long time. You find just ended up doing nothing, right? But that was something, it, it just went backwards and forwards quite a while arguing about that. And we could come up with reasons for doing either, but yeah. And there, there were many, a lot of other things as well. Some things just, um, some things just happened and they, they sort of hung around for quite a while or still, they're still there actually for it. So things like that. Well, how, was that? how did you feel, how do you recall that was resolved? Was it a, a set of experiments that you ran or did you just run out of steam and decide to implement the easiest approach and see, see yeah. what happened? Basically, basically that, right? <laughs> Somebody and, won by attrition. Yeah, yeah. And well, yeah, uh, it just happened a number of times going back and forth, what should things look like and how should they be? And, um, that, was, uh, that was one I remember because in a sense it was relatively simple in that case. It, it just took a while to work it out. But there are other things. We, uh, 
We had a lot of long discussions about things like this. I take it you remember about the pipes and the muff pipes. Oh God, yes, the pipes. They were the most complex things we ever added to the language to solve a problem that didn't exist, or rather, to was we'd mis totally misinterpreted the problem. Could, could you yeah. elaborate on that? What was the? Uh... I don't think anyone wants to know about that one. <laughs> okay, I can say. Well, I can. This is how I remember it. So, Mike, John will have to correct me here, but you, you have A and B making a call. Okay, side A and side B. And then, then A wants to talk to, or is going to talk to C instead. So it has to redirect who's talking to with, to C. And we thought, well, wouldn't it be fantastic? Why should A have to know if they're talking to B or C? They could just send the messages across and it'll end up in the right place. So therefore you don't send, therefore you don't send to a, a process, you, send, you have a pipe where you send the message along and you can redirect the pipe to have different receivers and the sender wouldn't know. We thought that be, that was fantastic, right? So we implemented pipes. We had a pipe algebra, if I remember correctly. We could munge pipes, merge pipes, ah, everything. And then we said, this is fantastic. We gave it across to them. They said, yeah, it's great, but we can't use it. Because our basic premise was that you could redirect without knowing who you're talking to was wrong. You have to know who you're talking to because you just you have to be able to redirect and work out if, you, if I can redirect. So the whole basic... A fundamental idea we had was wrong, right? And then we just removed pipes. And that, from that time, I think that was the most complex thing we had in the machine. Wasn't it, Mike? Oh, it was dreadful. It was absolutely dreadful. Yeah. So, oh, so, yeah. So, but we so just this missed is a, the problem, right? This is and, a dynamic that every programmer has ever faced, which is an investment in a solution. And then the realization that you got something wrong here. And, and the reality is that the right decision is to remove it yeah. and negate all of that work. How did that feel to you? Did it feel good and liberating? Or were you like, wow, we, we're throwing away a really nice piece of, uh, of a, a solution here? Well, both, both <laughs> actually. I mean, the realization, yeah, we can now get rid of this, but it was, it, we put a bit of effort into that. And uh... <laughs> Yeah, so it was just it was just removed. I mean, well, we could have left it. It, it would have made it was just a complex. <laughs> Mike, is it not your doggy? It's my doggy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So something something uh, I remember Joe saying, um, and it was very important to him, and I think for everyone on the on the in, in, in the team there to keep the language simple. And his his point that I've heard him make was that if you want to keep a language simple when you add a, a new feature, you have to remove an existing feature, which, which is really not something that language designers tend to say or no. look at things. Now, it does seem a little strange but to remove something, and I don't know if that was a rule, but um, it certainly has left a very, very simple language, and the new features don't really land. I mean, it's a conservative language. Could you talk a little bit about that, that philosophy of simplicity? You can do that if you haven't got users. If you haven't got a uh, if you haven't got a commercial back background. One of the things that I've been looking at recently is Python, and I think that when people move from Python two to Python three and put a lot of backward incompatibilities, this has caused an enormous amount of head scratching. And I think that sort of thing is is, is very very dangerous. You, should, you 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 have to sort of know when you've got to a state where you have to stop and you just keep it keep it as it is and resist changes. Yeah. Um, yes, we were very lucky in that case, and that, that that the user group we've mentioned, um, they were very tolerant to to changes. For it. Well, um, we have they, they, according to my schedule just a few minutes left. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about your, your the, the way that Joe had impacted you in this. And of course, you could, we could probably all go on for a day about this topic, but I asked you to think about one thing that, that changed you professionally or personally, Joe. And as you share that, you just go down the list and, and, and folk just share. I'm gonna just place, I'll show some of these photos from the team mm. from the early days. Well, I can, I, I can tell you one story that um, I think it was Joe's idea, I don't, maybe it was Bjorn's idea, we should write a book, which was the first uh, book, the uh, Concurrent Programming in Airline. 
and uh, we both had an allocated chapter. I wrote a few chapters, and Robert wrote a few chapters, and Joe wrote a few chapters. And um, I think both, both Robert and I thought, oh, we've got plenty of time to do this, and all, all the rest of it. But Joe said, it has to be ready by, I can't remember the date, by this date. It has to be ready. I promised the publisher from Prentice Hall it should be ready. But of course, when we got to that date, we were both, me and Robert were frantically sort of writing away and sort of, uh, <laughs> you know, we published the whole thing, the whole thing was written in tech as well, which makes life a bit harder as well. So, and uh, it was well, we, we sort of came to sort of, to, 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 to Joe and said, Joe, I'm afraid we haven't really got it ready in time. We're about, so we need a few more weeks. And Joe turned to me and said, oh, don't worry, you've got three months. I told you the date we was ready. We was, uh, we, we, he fibbed about the date we was ready. And so uh, it was actually three months later. <laughs> it was a pragmatic attitude to try and get things ready in time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So have you yeah. used that in your, uh, in your managerial career since then to... Uh... Oh, good Lord, yes, a good lesson. The standard managerial technique to sort of tell people things that have to be ready before they are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, the, the book was fun. That's... Oh, all right, when was this? Well, that, that, this is when we moved from, from Ericsson to this uh, LM Tell. We actually, ah. we moved from, from one, one part of Ericsson to another. And they happen to have a sort of a, a departmental magazine, so they wanted to write a, a, to have a little uh, uh, some information about us and uh, take a photograph. <laughs> and I don't know, so someone actually brought a bow tie and then brought a few extra bow ties. So that's quite a number of of, of, the, of the guys standing. <laughs> In wearing a bow tie. <laughs> but, yeah. Wow. <laughs> okay. By the way, the, the, the chap to the furthest right, standing there, Eric Hogerstein, he 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 was actually in the in the hardware world and he moved to Sun Microsystems in mm. the States and then he came back to Sweden and became professor of uh, computer architecture at Uppsala University. We've actually got two people from the former lab who have become professors. The other is Thomas Arch. Mm. So on that topic, I, there's a photo, I mean, I'm skipping ahead here, but I notice up here, so this is a lovely photo next to a Christmas tree, but I notice up here at the top, there's a there's Bell Labs here represented. And I know you, you collaborated with that group for That's something, and I don't recall what it is, but could somebody fill in the, the gap that, the pieces there? But we were actually invited to Bell, it was called Bellcor. And they, in, um, in December, I think 1991 or something. It looks like around yeah. Christmas time, maybe. Yes, yeah, to, it to, was. to give, give uh, <laughs> an airline course and also to talk to them about, uh, uh, well, systems design, etc. But that, that was quite fun. <laughs> we, I think we had a, a Saturday when we took a bus or into New York and wandered about. And that was in December. And we had no idea just how cold it can be. I mean, New York is, is on the coast. So it's it's li like Edinburgh or Glasgow. I mean, it was plus one degrees, <laughs> windy and 100% <laughs> humidity. <laughs> I remember when we got back, everyone rushed and had to have a hot bath to sort of get back. It was home. freezing. Yes. It was freezing. And we had was, no idea. Yeah. Yes, I remember that. That that was a lot of fun actually for um, talking and, with people from, from Belgium. And, and, and another thing I remember from that was. Uh, one lunch, we weren't going to the ordinary canteen, they were going to do something extra. <laughs> so we said, yes, we're going to have this very nice lunch <laughs> at the Japanese restaurant. <laughs> that, I think, was the first and only time that Mike's encountered sushi. <laughs> Just look at his face. It was a happy memory for the rest of us. <laughs> I still don't eat sushi. I refuse. <laughs> this is the first and only time. 
Yes, and the, this was a special lunch, and you didn't appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that was a fun, that was a good trip. Ah, oh, let's <laughs> wait. Wait, where, where, there's the telephones. What we've seen the telephone. You had another one there. P oh picture. yeah, sorry, I'm going all fast. Uh, so oh, you've seen that picture already. Yeah. Oh, that, yeah. This this looks like the set of the the Erlang the movie. In fact, <laughs> I know it is because. It was I, the same. I, I, I think this is that. the same clothes. This is the clothing you wore, at least in one scene. So I think this must have been an off, an, an off scene yeah. handed photo. Well, well Mike, all, uh, most of the time, actually wore a, a shirt and a tie. Yeah. And yeah. Me, Mike, Mike, when did you last have a tie? Oh, good Lord, that must be eons ago. Yes. <laughs> but you often had a tie there. I remember yes, that. Yes, uh, uh, there's, a little, there's a little reference to that in the book. Yes, there is indeed. One of the authors wears a tie, it says. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I know. Can, and that was can you. Somebody, can somebody talk a little bit about this movie and how it, how it came to be? Because it's quite an extraordinary movie, really. I mean, everybody knows well, about it. I think Jan already class. mentioned it. It was a result of, of filming the presentation we'd given at this conference. And uh, we got the sort of uh, Ericsson at that time had the professional uh, had the professional uh, team of, of movie makers, and quite why it actually became this sort of multi Python esque uh, thing I don't I don't quite know. It's sort of it was actually done very very seriously. We, uh, it, it wasn't oh, yeah. intended to be amusing, but in point of fact. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know whether when I watch it nowadays, whether to be nostalgic or whether to be embarrassed. <laughs> I remember. I remember two things from it. Um, one was uh, all the things we showed there. Actually, we actually did it. We actually made calls. We did all the updates and everything like that. It actually, it actually was showing real stuff. Right, it worked. And the other one was that when Mike is standing pointing to a, a switch, we had as you stand at this pointing to a small switch we had. That switch was very low. So he was standing in a hole in the floor so he'd so he get the right height for it. So he wouldn't sort of be pointing downwards to something around his waist, be pointing straight across instead. So one of his lab floors where they removed some things where he's standing down to that. that. That I still remember. That was very funny. Well, that's, that's, uh, the, 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 the program that we were working, that, that was running, that, that, that I had written that. And that was part of a sort of experiment I, that I did just all, all by myself. Uh, the idea was to put everything that had to do with features like in one module. And mm. I think you remember that, Robert. I mean, there's something wrong in module <laughs> feature. Yeah. That, I mean, yeah. That, that's where all the, these blacklists and everything was stuffed into there. It was just an experiment to see if I could, could write such a program. <laughs> Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I can just say here, watch the sequel. If you want, if you liked our movie, watch the watch Garrett's the sequel. That that's that's really funny. And what OTP stands for? Yes, that's <laughs> fantastic. Sorry about that. Yeah, uh, it's, um, so we covered this. So Robert, um, tell us a story <laughs> about Joe and how he changed your you know work or professional outlook or personal outlook. What what what's your story here? Um, well, not so much. Well, one, one, the, the evolving bit. I mean, the, the, the fact we're working, we're working with a system that evolved, right? For it, it wasn't something that was ready from the beginning. You, you, you have this and implement that. Working with something that evolved, that, that was, that was very new to me. Um, also, was that what, Joe's, as I said, what I remember, was that Joe's, uh, sorry, was that Joe's influence, or was this part of the? Culture here. Well, it, it was in the sense that um, before I've been working on our language, I've been looking at other, other languages and implement, done some implementations of them, but those languages were more or less fixed. They existed, uh, like the Parlog, Bjorn mentioned, for example, and, and Prolog and Lisbon. They exist in that sense of so implementing those. Here we were evolving the language, that, that was new. And that came very much from so when Joe started working with Erlang, or what became Erlang later. And um, the evolving, I, I was I was number two in that. I think Mike was number three, uh, working with these things. That 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 was something new new to me to do that type of thing to build systems like that. That was new. And also, as I mentioned, just the fact 
we'd often take quite long walks at lunch and just discuss things. It could be anything, it could be work, it could be uh, other things. That, that was also something that, um, that stuck with me and I remember very much for it. And also, of course, well, okay, so Joe was both a colleague at work, but is also a friend. And that, that um, for a very long time, I mean, since very quickly after he joined the lab, uh, we became friends and private friends and we've families have interacted and so on. So that, that's something I still I remember very much. And his music, of course. He was a great music fan, both for doing music and listening to music and writing systems afterwards for, for generating music as well too. But yeah, that, that, that's, that's still stuck for it. Oh. Jarno, what did you think of this, this guy when uh, this guy, Joe Armstrong, when Mike recruited him and brought him into the fold? What, what was your, what was your impression? Now, I know there's a story here of how how Mike and Joe met, and I, we're, we're almost out of time here, but he's a new face in your group, and, and what was your impression, Yarna? <laughs> I don't quite understand the question, actually. Oh, just, just what's your... Well, I mean... What's, what's, uh, what's a way that Joe... Joe um, well, I would. The fact that you're thinking about things. No, but it, I, he knew from the beginning just what we are trying to do, and uh, well, uh, he worked well with others. I mean, <laughs> yes, I, I don't see the problem. Uh, hmm. By the way, Mike, this photo, that chap to the left, was that not the person from from Belcor? He was from Belcor. Yes, that's right. Oh, yeah. Yes, I can't remember his name now. Can you? No, but he, he he visited us first, and then he invited us. Mm. Yeah. Garrett, we have a few questions uh, from the audience. Shall we take them in the Toucan Lounge afterwards? I think so. Or, yeah, I just want to yeah. be able to, because I think we have yeah. all of a minute here. Um, oh, yes. So we can, oh. we can move that on. You know, who, what's his name? The guy on the left here. What? Tony Johnson. He, yes. He was, was our manager. By the way, that's that photo is taken in my kitchen. So, <laughs> I mean, it's it's the same stuff as you can see see here behind still. Oh. I, I, I just had just had one comment on this. We were very lucky, the lab, that we had supporters higher up in management. Yes. And and he was he was he was one of our definitely one of our big important supporters. And that was one reason the lab could keep going, right? Because we had this support. And he didn't always agree with us, but I mean, he saw us as, as a valuable, a valuable uh, part of the company. So he had a lot of support. But, but every month, I wrote some sort of progress report, walking around asking people, "I want contributions to this progress report." There has to be things happening yeah. every time. <laughs> so I, we we uh, this is this is probably my, one of my favorites here in the in the bunch, and we are unfortunately out of time. Um, I just want to um, to wrap up here with um, a, a, you know personal observation from my experience with with you three, of course, with Joe, the community at large. Um, I've been out of the community for a few years now, um, working on some other projects, and they're not Erlang related. So unfortunately, I've not been able to to be really um, as close as I'd like to. But um, this technology is obviously a fantastic innovation. It's, it's, it's really a world changing innovation. We see how it continues to evolve. But from my personal standpoint, the big surprise for me was how wonderful the human beings are in this, this ecosystem. And I was, I was searching for, for, for photos here um, like this that show the growing ecosystem and, and the, the growing footprint of, of this, this technology. And I, I searched and it, it looked like a Facebook feed of my friends. And <laughs> It's incredible how my life has personally changed from being exposed to this technology, and it's really the human beings there. And I just want to thank you all uh, so much for, for your generosity. And, and I have a photo here of Francesco. Um, Francesco's a tireless work at bringing this community together and, and moving it forward. Um, it really has, has changed who I am in so many different ways and the, the friendships that I have. Um, and I, I think in this short conversation, we can all see how, how collegial and generous and kind and, and, and ultimately creative um, your community has been and continues to be. 
So just thank you very much for, for all of that. It really has impacted me. And I know I speak for so many people, um, so many people, it has affected a, a, all of us. So, so thank you and thank you for your time here. Thank you. Okay. No, no Let's give it virtual <laughs> tap right here. <laughs> we can, yeah, we, if, if anyone, oh, Robert, oh, you're, you're saying goodbye. Um, so uh, just to wrap up, um, I know people have a thousand questions and that's, we sort of intentionally moved these off to, uh, to, to just so, so we could have these retrospectives as much time as we possibly can. So please join us in the, what are the Toucan Lounge? What is it? Yeah. The something Lounge <laughs> and ask. And, There's and, a and, link uh, in the chat. There's a uh, link in the chat if you, as well too. But definitely, well, I think yeah. this is going to end, so we have to move to a different. This particular event will end, and you'll have to move to the the lounge. So we'll figure that we'll, we'll okay. figure out how to get there. But we'll go there, and you'll be able to get your questions answered. So thank you so, very much indeed for your time, uh, everybody, and the panelists. Um, thank you so much.